Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Thank you for tuning in, however you may be doing so, be it on air, online, live streaming through the free and reliable iHeartRadio app, or joining us over on the various social media pages. You can find us streaming on KTSMRadio.com, specifically, and again, the full video that we have, including the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook, El Paso History TV over on YouTube, and similar pages also on Twitter and Twitch.tv. TV, also under Andrew J. Polk, and of course on some of our partner Facebook groups, remember in El Paso when, and this is the place where we do say Texas history begins in El Paso. And we do have a history moment for you at the top of hour two from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk talking about some of the interesting facts and figures that have existed throughout El Paso history. But joining us here in studio right now, we are joined by uh, Janae Renault Field uh, with the Frontera Land Alliance, and then also Eric Pearson with the El Paso Community Foundation. Thank you both very much for joining us here today. Thank Thanks you for guys. having us. Absolutely happy to have you all on because this has been a momentous time period and kind of going forward because there's a culmination of a lot of efforts that have happened and also a lot more to come, specifically when it comes to Kasner Range, which as a concept has existed for, you know, let's just call it better part of a century, but then in the preservation sense has very much seen that culmination. When was that exact date of the announcement here? It, it seems kind of a whirlwind and a blur already. It was March 23rd of this year. March 23rd. So let's call it just under a month ago and the culmination in its own right of near 60 years worth of effort towards that, that kind of specific goal? Yeah, 52, who's counting, you know. <laughs> Give or take, but uh, generations, let's put it that way, of effort that has gone into this here. So when it comes to what has actually happened, I mean, this was big news in the community, but for anyone who's been under a particularly you know large and soundproof rock, kind of in a nutshell, what has happened now? Well, so President Biden, using the uh, Antiquities Act, uh, mm -hmm named Kastner Range as a national monument. And, and it's going to be under the, the management of, of the, the U.S. military under the Army. And so what we're going to see right away is is not much change. Um, this is a long process of cleaning up unexploded ordnance um, right. and making sure that people are safe to enter the property. But the long-term goal, maybe in my lifetime, maybe not, um, I'm not that young anymore. Um, is okay. to, is to give people access and and to really explore what this means for our region. You know, there's the mountain is is a part of who we are, no, and so absolutely. making sure that people have access to nature, making sure they understand what the history is prior to you know the the white man coming and writing those history books, um, understanding that there are flora and fauna that are unique in all the world in our desert and in our mountains um, and I think that's really important for people to understand that sense of place and you talked about uh, you always talk about history of Texas beginning mm. in Paso well there is geological history that begins here oh, absolutely. and is unique in in all of the world and so we're, we're very excited to be able to see that and one day I'm looking at Janae I think I'm older than you are but in Janae's lifetime <laughs> being able to travel those trails because, I mean, there is a lot there. So let's talk about the specific area we're discussing as it is. Do we have a, a rough-ish map up of it all and over on our uh, social media if you want to take a look at that. So here we have displayed both the area in the like lighter green of the Franklin Mountains State Park. And then that shaded area, that kind of teal portion, that's the Kasner Range area that we're talking about. That's kind of roughly described. It's basically bounded by 54 on its eastern part. And then uh, on the southern part, I want to say, what do you, you even call that like southern bound there? How do you describe that one? That one's Hondo Pass. Hondo Pass there. And then uh, in the north, I want to say that's like near MLK Boulevard, something like that. It goes up to about Chuck Heinrich. Chuck Heinrich. And then basically goes right up until not quite the peak itself then of, you know, the you know, Franklin Mountain that is right there when you're going kind of in between. And you can drive straight through this because this is basically on either side of Trans Mountain Road. That's right. correct. Yep. Yeah. You can drive through it. There are um, signs up now stating when you're entering Kastner Range right. National Monument and a sign stating when you're leaving Kastner Range National Monument. And along the way, you can stop and pull off and see overlooks where you can see the wonderful geology or views of Kastner Range. So 
on those overlooks, those are the ones that are like the shelters and there is designated parking, do not go anywhere that does not have a very clearly defined pull-off spot. There are some places that uh, used to be able to that have been fenced in recent years because, among other things, uh, people may remember the, you know, Fort Bliss Military Reservation, Hasta La Vista, entering and leaving signs. I'll admit for a little bit of nostalgia towards those, but very appreciative of the change. But then there are still very much those, uh, well, it's the, the red and white signs talking about the blow you up stuff, the UXO unexploded ordinance. So, and again, that's kind of one of the, the questions going forward that we'll talk a little bit about here, about kind of what the need is and maybe what some possibilities are because yeah the Kazna range is not just a oh it's just a different way to describe an area no this was a firing range and used for basically anything besides nukes is my understanding in the arsenal of the army at that point in time i mean up until basically uh, world war ii is a pretty close approximation right so it was an active firing range um, and training site from the 20s to 1966 when mm, they closed there you down. Go. Okay. So, yeah, that comes a lot of time and being actively used like that, everything from small arms to artillery, there's a lot of... There's a lot of stuff that's still out there. Again, a uh, story that I remember being told about uh, from someone that was out at the... I mean, there is stuff in that footprint already, such as, uh, you know, the Archaeological Museum for the city of El Paso, the Border Patrol Museum, and then, of course, like, you know, Wilderness Park Trail. And those are well-defined trails right next and adjacent to the Archaeology Museum, which has been cleared and has, you know, gardens, plantings, and things. And you need to stay on those if you're going out there because there's a story from a gentleman who used to be out there and involved with it about, you know, natural environment, occasionally range fires, those kind of things. And the uh, time when that happened back in, I want to say, about the 90s that he counted dozens of different separate uh, pops or explosions going off from the stuff that was still left out there. So I actually witnessed that firsthand. So I was a news photographer for oh, KTSM TV back in the day. And as a young photographer carrying a camera up with those firefighters working on oh, wow. range fires. Um, those brush fires were were setting off all kinds of things, and and the firefighters were fearful. You know, it, it was, yeah. you know they were they were kind of chuckling it off, like, "Oh my gosh, that's happening!" But you could see that there was there was some concern that something was going to just head in their direction. Luckily, none of that happened. But you mm -hmm. heard those pops, and I, I witnessed it firsthand. Wow, probably so, about ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, that that that's yeah. again that about what I was told here. So that's. I mean, that was, at that point, about 30 years after it had been elapsed in use. So, yeah, that is still very much, and there have been a news story or two about people uh, doing misadventures going off into those areas so recently. So, that kind of highlights the question of, you know, what now happens going forward. So, but we're going to talk further about that uh, because, I mean, it's still very exciting that this has happened because some of the questions that have existed to this point in time about essentially what would be the future of that site. So essentially from y'all's perspective and the efforts that have gone into this, what are the possibilities kind of going forward? What are the things that you would all like to see happen? So, you know, the big part of it right now is is, is focusing on a cleanup that is manageable. Um, mm. The current standard for cleaning up this kind of firing range is to dig a hole a foot deep every foot, and, and mm. that would destroy what we have. So what, uh, okay. what we'd like to see is a focus on the existing trails. There's a Jeep road that runs through there that we could probably, you know, deal with right away mm. okay. and, and, and start to, to move in that direction. Um, the, the Department of the Army has really about till middle May, uh, maybe a week after that, to come up with a, a, a plan and, mm. and present it to, to the U.S. government. And so... Uh, I think that's where we're going to really try to advocate for the access points as they exist. And, and I, I will tell you that prior to the fences going up, you know, I was a mountain biker. So there were a lot of people uh, who I never saw going on Kastner Range, wink, wink. Mm -hmm. um, but, but so there, there are trails out there that have been used for many years. And so if we can find and identify those, those places that are probably reasonably safe and then, you know, put signs on the side of them and say, if you step off the trail, you will likely explode. I, I think we can get or there. something um, to that effect, <laughs> but but it's going to take a lot of years, and and I think that um, General Eisenhower, who is the commanding general at Fort mm. Bliss, um, said it very clearly. You know, this is a big change in what we're looking at and the right. way we're looking at it, but it's not going to change the range for many years, and so we just have to be patient. We've been patient for fifty two years. Um, yeah, uh, Janae and I, you know, we were born, and <laughs> and they were already working on Kastner Range, so. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be a little bit patient for maybe another five, ten years before we come up with a, a cogent plan to develop that area in a way that is safe for all humans. 
because it's it's kind of a, a paradox or you know an interesting dichotomy of the fact that this site, among the reasons that it frankly could still be saved, that it existed to be so, is because it was developmentally inaccessible, in essence. Correct, but they did, um, Castor Range used to be larger. So there mm. was 1,200 acres that were separated and sold off for different uses for mm. development, schools, parks. And so over time, it has changed and has shrunk in size. Mm. And this is the remaining part where I think people became active 52 years ago and trying to find a way to conserve it for the community because they saw the value that it provided as a uh, part of the state park. And I'm not mm. throwing shade on Walmart, but th that's the kind of use that, that the kind of remediation that I described would lend itself to. You know, cover it sure. up, put in a parking lot, develop it in a way that doesn't support our region, doesn't support the alluvial fan where the water seeps down into our mm. Lake Obolson. I mean, there are so many reasons to protect this open space. Um, and the way you do that remediation lends itself to it, to the Walmarts and the, the super centers and all those things that are not uh, in keeping with what we wanted to do. And so that's mm -hmm. that was the risk 52 years ago and, and up until last month. Yeah, last month. I mean, the idea of, like you mentioned, dig a you know, dig it down every different foot would involve just, you know, clearing out the area. And then, of course, what lends itself to that, you know, pouring concrete, bulldozing the rest of it and just building up around it. And that's what has existed, I mean, immediately adjacent to all this area. In fact, right across 54, you know, it's a concrete sea for the most part. I mean, there's some developments with some grass and like, you know, apartments and that kind of thing. But for the most part, like immediately adjacent to it, you do have some, you know, shopping centers, you do have the gas station, like there's, I think there's a Lowe's over there and it's just, you know, sees a concrete and then juxtaposed right across 54 with this area. So again, it's an interesting dichotomy that the fact that it both is arguably been easier to preserve than not because of the fact that no one really wanted to deal with this in a way that wasn't it, it already remediated and has also now made it so that it can still exist to be preserved. But now that question still presents itself so we're going to delve even further into that because again there are questions and people wanting to know about how we can go out and do this and also i mean all the stuff that's been happening out there including like poppy's fest and all those kind of things and things that will continue to be preserved but again joining us here in studio right now we do have uh, janae renault fields with the frontera land alliance and again eric pearson with the el paso community foundation talking further with them about what is going on what has happened and again those plans going forward so stay tuned after this next break here on the el paso history radio show on news radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140. For souvenirs, gifts, and decor, Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. 
That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, we are the El Paso History Radio Show on Facebook. Go there for our weekly promo announcements for the upcoming topics of the shows each and every week. And also the YouTube channel, again, youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, where you can both find the archive of the shows that we have done online like this, including the also the entire archive of El Paso Gold DVDs from Capstone Productions covering more than the last 20 years of history production here in town, fully uploaded free for your viewing pleasure, plus the recent 20 ABC7 TV segments from El Paso History TV with featuring Bernie Sargent, and I was behind the camera on a lot of them talking about some of those interesting topics in and around the area. And so, yeah, those are up there, and you can check us out in all the different ways you can also find us, so make sure to find them there if that is what works for you. But again, joining us here in studio right now, we are joined by uh, Janae Renault field with the, again, Frontera Land Alliance. And again, uh, we do have also representatives from the El Paso Community Foundation, Eric Pearson. So when it comes to talking about the efforts that go into this, I mean, given that it's, you know, the better part of, you know, over half a century going into this from the time that it, the preservation became available, and then this started being uh, actually worked on, there have been a lot of people very involved in this. And so there are some people that uh, you all want to recognize, among other things, right? Of course, you know, we inherited the effort. Uh, Janae and I were talking about this the other day. The foundation got involved about 12, 13 years ago. Um, it, it actually resulted in, in the Frontier Line Alliance hiring Janae, which was one of the greatest things they ever did, honestly. Mm. She is a huge asset to the community, but she inherited those, those relationships with people like Scott Cutler, who uh, has been an activist for a long time. Um, uh, definitely Richard Teschner, who, mm -hmm. you know, single-mindedly has has moved forward in a very very smart way to help get us where we're going and uh none more than judy ackerman who you know would stand outside the walmart handing out uh pamphlets getting signatures and also went to the pentagon to meet with the mm -hmm. undersecretary of the army so she she covered it uh from every aspect of it and we lost her last november and so that's that's a, a real shame that she couldn't see 
her dream come to fruition, but we're all there and we're all thinking of her at that time. Um, one of the great things that happened at the celebration, you mm -hmm. want to talk about that, Janae? Um, the, under the, uh, Rachel Jacobson announced that there is going to be a trail named Judy Ackerman Trail. will be uh -huh. the first trail announced for Castor Range National Monument. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So there are some of those plans kind of as a case in point then of how the site will end up being used again beyond the kind of general, okay, there's is stuff that needs to be done. So there's that kind of already kind of initial planning of uh, future co use coming from this and of course the recognition of one of the major contributors to this kind of thing. Now, her not being able to see the fruition of this is, is a shame in a variety of ways, but I got to say, it kind of felt like it. Maybe this is just a retrospect kind of view that it felt like this was getting closer because, I mean, even some of the ways y'all were, as we've had you on in previous times on the show with the Frontier Land Alliance, talking about, well, there's some things in the works kind of ways. So I don't know. Maybe there was a level of satisfaction to be had to that it was getting closer. But I mean, how, how did this actually end up finally coming together? Was this a, okay, finally we're there or a, oh, hey, it's it's happening yeah. finally? So, you know, there, there was a lot of work going in, and it moves very slowly in yeah. our estimation, um, but but very quickly at the speed of government. Um, so <laughs> sure, um, we had to check a lot of boxes. We had to have you know, the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Haaland, visit. And so her mm -hmm. visit was was one of those things that we had to see. We had to have the president understand that. We, you know, Janae and, and the team at the Community Foundation and obviously uh, Judy uh, gathered more than 137,000 signatures to show that mm -hmm. support. Um, so we had all these things that we were required to do. Money was a big part of it. We raised over $100,000 and we have pledges of over a million dollars coming in to mm, help, okay. help do this. So, you know, there were a lot of things that the government was looking for. The hardest part was making sure that the Department of the Army and the Department of the Interior were, were talking. Um, and, and that was uh, that was a big okay. part because, you know, the Army doesn't want to give this up because where does the liability sit? So sure. overcoming that was, was, was key. And so about nine months ago uh, in July of last year, uh, we all went on a on a junket and visited the the Pentagon and Veronica Escobar, who was huge and, and a really, really a linchpin in making sure this happened sure. because, you know, she just really went after it brought everyone together. And and the other part of it, which I think was important and allowed us to get where we're going, is that the undersecretary of the Army is from El Paso, went to Hank's High School. His name is Gabe, Camar yeah. Gabe Gabriel Camarillo, and and he was a champion. Um, and I, I joked at the celebration, you know, I, I, I go to the Pentagon, I go through all the security, we have to mm -hmm. your phone, you know, the, the whole thing. And then we, we end up talking about uh, L&J Cafe. <laughs> so um, that was a little surreal moment for all of us, but but it, it proved that um, one of the, the best El Paso exports is its people. And sure. because even though people leave El Paso, it doesn't leave them. And, and so I think that's really important. So having that team in place at this time with this president, all of it coming together, we they knew about it probably six months before we knew um, yeah, okay. but we all had our inklings and so it was really it was really kind of the to, to quote the army because they're managing this hurry up and wait situation <laughs> Yeah, that's often the case whenever, again, the uh, federal government or even specifically the Army comes into play here. And, of course, so the announcement that this happened along with, as, you know, uh, the creation of, it was one of two national monuments that was created at that point in time. Also the, uh, and I'm not going to pronounce this one right, Avi Avikwa Ame, actual area? Avika May. Avika May. There you go. And that one over in Nevada. And to kind of both, for both of these, maybe more with that one, in like modern indigenous implications, but also in this one, very much historical ones as we talk about, you know, the, uh, you know, indigenous uh, evidence that there is of habitation and art and then, you know, more modern actual use of it up until basically we start talking about it becoming the range, basically. So this is part of a, you know, larger thing that has happened. And then, of course, just within our region, it does join the ranks of other such, you know, national monuments as, you know, happen and in previous administrations with the, you know, Oregon Mountains and stuff like that. So, you got different models being needed to be used for both of these locations. But when it comes to that, that level of recognition, and again, talking a little bit about some of the resources that are going to need to be employed here are certainly important. But there are other types of resources in general for development that start becoming available because of designations like this, right? Absolutely. You know, the, the key, though, in, in my head is is that we we have this perpetual protection right. and and so whatever resources we're employing are with that in mind and mm -hmm. i think that's important because um you know this 
uh, when when uh, President Obama, you know, we were very close to teetering on the edge of, of getting that. Right. That there, I remember that effort right going by right at the um, like last six months of that office. Yeah. yeah. And they said, oh, he's going to do it right before he leaves us. You know, and we, we didn't know what was going on. But but at the at the end of the day, we, we did get into the National Defense Authorization Act. And so hmm. Hmm. although uh, there was no resource going into Castle Range more than it ever had been, it had that line, which is like line 1,455 sure. of the National Defense Authorization Act that said no development would happen on Castor Range. So that bought us some time, but it was only annual time. So sure. every year they had to renew that act. And so this puts us in a situation where, you know, the foundation, for example, and and the people who are investing in Castor Range can really make it matter. Um, if if you are in limbo all the time, you're not going to invest deeply in that community that's that's in limbo. Mm. You're going to wait until you have some stability, and I think that's that's what really gets us there. Um, not necessarily that the resources were never available and are available sure. now. Okay. It's that that we're able to use them in a way that allows us to add value to the project without fear of it going away. Because as much as there's aspirations and what you all want to see happen with the site now that'll still be under development, it's not all simply aspirational. It's not a, oh, this is what we want to happen. This is what we could happen if this other thing were just to take place, this designation, so to speak. So now with that in place, it makes it, oh, this is real. And so therefore, people can be a little bit more firm in planning, so to speak, or how they interact with it, even if not directly with y'all's organizations, right? No, and, and, and that's that's a big part of it. So we do have aspirations for a oh, trail absolutely. system that goes all the way around the mountain. And, you know, uh, because Kastner Range comes into Franklin Mountain State Park, sure. comes into some nap land that the Frontera Land Alliance owns uh, conservation easements for, all the way down to Murkison Rogers Park, which some people know as Scenic Point. So yeah. you could build a trail system right there with water stops um, in the next you know, as soon as we get some trails through Kastner Range, sure. we can connect those pretty quickly. Those are the easier dominoes to fall. And so that's exciting news, and we know that we can add value to those things right away. Um, and protecting that mountain, um, and this is a long time ago, I'm going about 20 years, but the Institute for Policy and Economic Development in El Paso said, what are the, what are the most important assets we have for quality of life in this community? And in the top three of every response was the mountain. And mm, so protecting mm. that mountain is so important and protecting the entirety of it. This is a huge piece and a huge win for a lot of people who worked a long time on this. And it really speaks of the community asking for what it wants and finally being heard. Absolutely. So we're going to talk more about that. And again, that is uh, Eric Pearson, again, with the Community Foundation. Again, also joining us here in studio is Janae Renault Field uh, with the Frontera Land Alliance, talking more about what is going on with Kasner and again, some of those plans and some of those things that can happen. So we're going to take that next break now. So we'll be back right after this break with more on the El Paso History Radio Show here on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page. Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 
915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his Legacy Home Team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Paul, taking a minute to mention some of our other great partners in promoting different aspects of El Paso history, including the great group over at Celebration of Our Mountains, uh, often having a lot of, well, visits to sites like this in a safe way or other general field trips, tours, uh, hikes in and around the area. It's not just about the mountains, but also the physical environment we inhabit. Returning to a bit of form, both returning to their roots and branching out in a way they're now going to be meeting Thursdays, last Thursday of each month, starting this month, so end of this one, at Artovino's Desert Crossing at 7 p.m. For any information about that, how to get involved, or even to lead a tour yourself, I uh, want you to reach out via email, philipgoodell43 at gmail.com. That's P-H-I-L-I-P-G-O-O-D-E-L-L. 43 at gmail.com to talk about what they got going on and what they have coming up. But uh, speaking about uh, mountains in a different way, again, we are joined here in studio by the Frontera Land Alliance and the El Paso Community Foundation, Janae Renault Field as the executive director of the Frontera Land Alliance, and of course, Eric Pearson as a president and CEO of the El Paso Community Foundation. So when it comes to, again, the kind of development, and you mentioned a little bit about the aspirational goals here, but when it comes to kind of any piece of land that comes available like this. I mean, we've had a couple other examples, not of necessarily this type of logistical problems, but of areas that were, you know, being desired somewhat in use, but then getting this kind of official, okay, stuff can start happening with it in this kind of both preservation and, you know, public use kind of way. Lost Dog Trail is what most commonly comes to mind as having had recent dish action on it anyway and i mean it, different size of scope of community involvement i'm just going to put it that way so when it comes to just kind of what that type of similar situation would then have when it comes to kasner what does that look like what is the process besides of course the you know uxo and those parts of it Okay, and so for Lost Dog, it was a uh, conservation easement was placed on the land in May of 2021. Mm -hmm. And according to the conservation easement terms, uh, we follow those guidelines to enforce the uses of the surface of the land. Mm -hmm. And one of those is for the Frontier Land Alliance is working in collaboration with the El Paso Water Utilities to manage the trail system. Mm. And the trails were just um, before, just random, not structured. And so part of Frontera's Land Alliance obligation was to place uh, trail signage up okay. along the trails. There's about 10 miles of trails. Wow. There have social trails is when individuals create their own. We uh, remove those when found and reported to us. We removed illegal dumping when it's found. 
Uh, sure. We find mm. people dump everything over their back wall into the conservation easement lands. Some people have created fire pits, and those are removed. Uh, we, um, the biggest, I think, waste that is dropped are dog bags, and they just leave them there. Uh. And so it's sure. a lot okay. of etiquette, trail etiquette, leave no trace, get people to stay on the trails. The signage of the trails match the state park, the Franklin Mountain State Park. Oh, okay. So the transition from the city land into the state park should be seamless. And um, we all expect the same type of courtesy of use of the land. I'm sure that you all often end up running into an attitude of, well, this is available out here. I can do what I want. But the idea that is, again, trying to be reinforced is about, sure, you can use it as you want, but you also want to make sure doing it in such a way that it will continue to be available and desirable for the reason y'all came out here in the first place, basically. I mean, I'm sure you talk about it differently, but that's kind of my perspective on it. Yeah, we, you know, it makes me concerned if people abuse the lands with the mm -hmm. conservation easement because then at some point maybe the conservation value leaves, which means the easement leaves, which leads to potential development. And so it, you, you've got to respect the desert. It takes a long time for it to regenerate. There is a very delicate soil surface. There's a lot of insects and birds and mammals mm -hmm. and plants and we need to respect that land as we are using it. Absolutely. So kind of taking that model and applying it to Kasner range as it goes, again, different difficulties, blow you up stuff, among other things. But when it comes to doing that, I guess maybe not as many the again, the social trails, as you put it there, the ones that are kind of developed as there has not been as much common use out there due to, among other things, those, you know, red and white signs saying don't go here. So when it comes to kind of applying that as the, you know, development comes through, what will that process end up looking like, again, once the other logistical hurdles are kind of passed? Um, it will take time. It yeah. will be done in phases. They're going to need to look at the contour of the land. They're going to need to look at arroyos. They're going to need, they've done great investigation. They've identified the locations of the UXOs and the MECs. It's all public information. It's out there in a no, PDF. Okay. And so people can take a look. They know where the greater concentrations are. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. it, it's been a good training opportunity. They've used new technology to identify where they are at. But it will take time to determine the type of use. Um, is it going to just be hiking? Are they going to include mountain biking? Are they going to mm. include other types of recreational uses? Uh, when the proclamation was announced by the president, they shared that there would be a public input process within the next 60 days. And so we we're waiting to hear when that uh, will be okay. announced. And then they will invite the public to provide opinion. And at that point, we will be happy to share it with everybody so everybody can share and speak up. So when it comes to that then public input aspect of it here, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of people have the idea that, okay, the designation has happened, it's all good to go, people will take care of these kind of things. When it comes to what will, what will be going into that public input period, the kind of stuff that would either be appropriate or, or desirable to have put forward, what kind of things are you all going to be looking forward there specifically? So I, I think the big part of it is what the use is going to be. You know, okay. what what is the will of the community to use this? Is is it mountain biking? Is it just hiking? Are there going to be camping sites? Are there going to be overnight camping okay. sites? What what are what are the possibilities? And and I think um, that's going to be framed ar around probably a tight frame of uses that that doesn't include motor vehicles, et cetera, in the same sure. way. Um, and then I I th and I'm just going to go back to what we were talking about a second ago. Those those social trails. Uh, right. Respecting that. Uh, through this process is going to be really important because certainly uh, what we're going to end up with if we don't have that is we're going to we're going to just let people you know just run amok in a, in a place where there is a potential for danger and yeah. so I think setting the habit on Lost Dog Trail or anywhere you're hiking within the Franklin Mountains whether it's a state park it's important to respect that process not only casting range of course you know you might you might be hurt but not only because sure. of that but because there are thousands of people who use those trails every day and the one bad apple theory applies here sure if they're and i'm not picking on mountain bikers i'm but you know if someone goes and builds a ramp which which was a problem over the last couple of years especially mm -hmm. during the covid lockdown um People were building ramps on the side of the mountain you have to have them removed it it, it destroys and leaves a scar that doesn't heal for a very long time. Right. And and so this public uh, input session 
we want to really think about what those uses will be, not what, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a zip line? You know, we can go on and on and sure. on. But at the end of the day, we want to be as comprehensive in the, in the types of uses we can do so we can manage that access and manage that use and prevent people from just going off and doing whatever they want to do anyway. Let's make sure it's in the plan if we can, if we can figure it out. Okay, so you get both aspirational and then practical because, again, the way people use trails or should use trails is important. With, again, that just added level of, yeah, this site has issues when it comes to going into what will be non-cleared areas. Because, again, with this being deployed over years, if not decades, with doing it in a way that, because, I mean, sure, it could just be effectively uh, bulldozed and cleared and removed all of that stuff by, you know, in a short time frame, but that's not the purpose here. The purpose is to preserve what's there and do such a way that it'll be able to be used and safely able to be used. So there's always going to be some kind of inherent thing, but also, like you mentioned, that there are areas of use, areas of focus, because, I mean, as much as we're talking about this being a range and large different varieties of ordnance being used, it wasn't just a, all right, just fire in that direction, guys, and just shoot whatever. I mean, there were different ranges, small arms, you know, uh, explosives, rocket propelled, what have you. So there are some, you know, details on where the I'm sure there's more interest than not, even if there is a kind of, you know, question mark in a lot of ways to put it in uh, old Minesweeper terms. Not everything is an eight square, so to speak. Yeah, and, and physics tells you that the heavier uh, ordnance is going to be deeper. Sure. And, and so what, you know, if you hear pops, you know, when there's a brush fire or whatever it is, right. that, that's going to be the smallest stuff on the surface. The bigger stuff is what we'd be worried about. And, and that's sure. going to be, it's going to be deeper. So, you know, the trails are important. 30 years ago, Waco tanks, you know, people were up in arms from all over the uh, world because sure. Waco tanks was this big rock climbing, you know, Mecca. Absolutely. And when the state park limited access and it was a good thing for that park because its ability to manage the ecosystem, which is very delicate, became the important part of it. And so instead of having a bunch of belay hooks in the middle of, of a rock, I'm, I'm all for rock climbing. We have rock faces that are beautiful that still have art that's, you know, five, 10,000 yeah. years old and, and evidence of that use. So I'm really proud that the state stood up at that time and did what it needed to do. And that's what we hope will happen here is we have a, a really comprehensive plan for what that use may be, but really comprehensive rules around that frame. Because essentially what we're talking about is mixed use, probably. I mean, much as the preservation and keeping the natural environment is one of the uses mixed in with how the public can access it, be able to enjoy it, whatever form that takes place. So each of these have, I would argue, I would say, you know, equal weight because, and each of them needs to, because if you just have it, yeah, go crazy out there, even if it wasn't inherently dangerous as it came to it, uh, that would therefore eventually end up degrading the aspect of it and why people would want to go out there. And then sure, sure, someone down the line would say like, oh man, this place used to be so great. What happened? And then it'd come down to a, yeah, well, yeah, nothing. That, that's the problem. You've described the, the purpose of a national monument in, in my mind was not to keep people off. It was to, yeah. to allow them onto it and, and, you know, explore the the richness of our region and maintain the richness of our region. And so the purpose of that is to provide access. We just have to make sure that it, that it fits around those rules. Absolutely. So, again, that's Eric Pearson, El Paso Community Foundation, also with us in studio right now, is uh, Janae Renault Field with the, uh, again, Frontera Land Alliance, talking more about those plans, the things going on, and uh, more on the details on what has happened and what will be happening. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this quick break on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140. For souvenirs, gifts, and decor, Mission Del Rey Southwest. 
Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Another quick note about uh, some of our partners in promoting different aspects of El Paso history, including the great group over at, uh, and specifically Rick Kern at Talk and Rock Radio, with his music podcast going off into memories of those performers, performances, acts, locations, and everything with the musical and performance history, particularly from like the golden age of rock and roll, but a whole lot more. One of his more recent episodes involving the Circle as one of the opening act for the Beatles, previous ones including the Grassroots and the Peppermint Twist and a lot of different memories of, again, performers, places that came through and had events here in town. So, again, talkandrockradio.com is where you can find that and them. But, again, uh, joining us here in studio right now, we do, again, have uh, Janae Renault field uh, the Executive Director with the Frontera Land Alliance, and, again, Eric Pearson, President and CEO with the El Paso Community Foundation. Again, there's a lot that's been going on with Kasner Range and is to come. So, specifically when it comes to that, that public Public comment that input on what can or, or should be done that is still as at least of uh, we're recording right now here in uh, middle of April to be coming but there is some plans that you all are at least working on when it comes to at the very least getting the word out about that right yeah I, I think our activity uh, moving forward will be communicating what's happening with the Department of the Army under that management and and that public input process is really important to us uh, very specifically. So we'll be working on that. And uh, just some other examples of things that the foundation has done with that public input at a high level when we were doing La Nube, the children's museum mm -hmm. that's going up. We did 33 public meetings. We had them downtown. We took them on the road to libraries around town um, with the Weiler Aerial Tramway, which sure. is in the legislature right now. Again, that's yes. That's my <laughs> knock on wood. Sorry, I'm not trying to. But but uh, we, we had online surveys. We, we met mm -hmm. with about 14 different groups um, and, and asked the public to get involved and had more than 3,000 responses on what should happen with the new tramway. So that's something we will do. Uh, we don't know what the parameters that the sure. Department of Rights is going to put out, but as soon as we find out, we're going to make sure it's known and make sure we have optimum public input and make sure that we are pushing, pushing, pushing them to listen to what, we're ha what we have to say as a community. Because, again, I think there's, at least in some of the general public, I mean, I'm sure not in y'all's mind, that, okay, hey, it's been, you know, it's been preserved. It's been declared the monument. And so, you know, hey, that's the finish line. We're good. But really, this is just the start. This is where the work begins for sure. Because, I mean, as much as there has been stuff that has been, I mean, a lot of work gone into this, not to denigrate that by any means, but this or that it was all trying to reach this one point and now things branch out in so many directions of what can be done so i'm sure uh, particularly janae when it comes to you know frontera land alliance that there's a lot of you know, excitement and anticipation of what comes next oh we're excited um we have the conservation easement on the south border of castle range national monument the nap land nature preserve mm -hmm. and their potential trail connectivity there's 
definitely crossover of mammals. We've seen javelinas oh. standing on Napland looking into Castner Range. And so there's a lot of education opportunity here as well with outreach. We could go into schools. We can bring the schools out there. Mm. We can do hands-on learning, just things that the community may not have access to right now. And so it just provides a great opportunity to connect and teach people the value of the desert. So again, as this process continues on, a lot of moving parts that will hopefully all end up coming back and into fruition and making this an uh, exciting and usable space. But again, it'll be a lot more work to come here, so I'm sure we'll be talking with you all a lot more further as it comes with that. Uh, getting towards the end of this hour right now, so again, uh, joining us here in studio right now has been uh, Eric Pearson, again, President and CEO with the El Paso Community Foundation. You're having to depart with us, so thank you very much for talking to us about these aspects and what's coming. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, and uh, Janae, you'll be sticking around with us as we continue on talking about the history of the site and it comes with that so look forward to talking with you an hour or two great thank you and back with you all after this break and the top of the hour news on news radio 690 ktsm stay tuned you are listening to the el paso history radio show streaming on facebook where you can find archive radio programs the el paso history radio show also streams on the facebook page remember in el paso when run by chief administrator barbara given baney known as bgb Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m1ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archive radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos 
of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. 
Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I'm your host, Andrew J. Polk, uh, continuing on with our conversation about Kasner Range and particularly with the Frontera Land Alliance in Hour 2 of the program. But first off, starting the Hour 2, as we usually do with a history moment from documentary filmmaker Jackson Polk, this week talking about the history of both the street and the person named at, that is named after of Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino Drive is a major access street for a large section of East El Paso. But who was it named after? Retired professional golfer Lee Trevino is regarded as one of the greatest players in the game's history. He was inducted to the World Golf Hall of Fame in 1981. Trevino won six major championships and 29 PGA Tour events over the course of his career. He is one of only four players to twice win the U.S. Open, the Open Championship, and the PGA Championship. The Masters Tournament was the only major that eluded him. He is an icon for Mexican-Americans and is often referred to as the Merry Mex and Super Mex, both affectionate nicknames given to him by other golfers. He was born in a town near Dallas in 1939, and his grandfather gave him some old golf balls and a golf club. Lee snuck onto golf courses and taught himself how to hit. Lee became a caddy and continued to improve his game. Playing in windy conditions, he developed his own distinct, unique, and compact swing method. Trevino is remembered as one of the very finest shot makers of all time. As a young man, Trevino served a tour with the Marines, then went to work as a, as a club professional in El Paso. He made extra money gambling for stakes in head-to-head matches. He qualified for the U.S. Open in 1966 and again in 1967 and shot 283, eight shots behind champion Jack Nicholas and only four behind runner-up Arnold Palmer. From 1968 to 1981, Trevino won at least one PGA tournament event a year, a streak of 14 seasons. He also won more than 20 international and unofficial professional tournaments. From 1983 to 1989, he worked as a color analyst for PGA Tour coverage on NBC. I'm Jackson Polk with this History Moment for the El Paso History Radio Show. And again, a mention of our great partner in doing El Paso history work, including Barbara Given Bainey, operator of the great Facebook group Remember in El Paso When. You can go there for archive pictures and remembrances galore. They have uh, almost 34,000 members as of last check, and it's no mean feat to keep such a large group on task and on track. So remember, please, if you do are using or looking at for their photos, the admins ask that uh, you please give history, uh, when you're talking about the history attached with those pictures, that you give credit to their site. And of course, a lot of credit to be given to Chief Admin Owner and Historian Barbara Given Bainey, affectionately known as BGB, along with admins Rick Duncan, Rick Nahara, Margaret D. Smith, and Jim Gerber, along with moderators uh, Ben Vincent, Dan Graves, and more. They're always looking for a more few good hands. So if you're wanting to be involved with or just join and see what is going on and those conversations and, again, the many postings of history, Remember in El Paso When. The Facebook group, Remember in El Paso When. But, again, joining us here in studio right now, we are joined uh, still by uh, Janae Renault-Field with the, again, uh, executive director for the Frontera Land Alliance. Again, uh, Eric Pearson had to depart for us for the second hour of the recording. But we got plenty to talk about still, particularly when it comes to the history both of this efforts and what that site is talking specifically again about Kasner range as we have had that uh, major news in this yeah, I'll just call it less than a month ago of the preservation and ad infinitum going to be going on with that area we have shaded in teal for the map there uh, nestled into the Franklin Mountains State Park as what now is going to be the Kasner range uh, national monument and a lot of Dope stuff has already been going on around this, honestly. Again, the replacement of the signs that happened pretty immediately after this designation was actually finally announced, right? Yeah, that's correct. So the Castle Range National Monument has an entrance sign as you're going up Trans Mountain Road, and it has your leaving Castle mm-hmm. Range as you're driving out of it. Absolutely. So, again, replacing some of those, again, old and maybe mildly nostalgic for some of the uh, former ones. And, uh, yes, the black and red signs are still up, white, black, and red signs that are about uh, the UXO Unexploded Ordinance are still out there, make no mistake. But just the changes to this and the way that, again, the possibilities now is very exciting. You have some of the proclamations and some of the language that was being actually announced as part of this, right? Yeah, so this is a 52-year effort that Um, became a national monument through the Antiquities Act of 1906. That happens through the writing of a proclamation mm -hmm. where there's a bunch of whereases where it's (laughs) stated. And what this says is that the U.S. Army will manage the national monument. 
consistent with the protection of the objects of historic and cultural significance and will commence a land management planning process with robust public engagement in the next 60 days. And so we're looking forward to providing input on different opportunities that may happen on Castner Range National Monument. So again, yeah, that particularly that public input, we were talking a lot about that end of last hour. So that's one of those TBD kind of things because we're not even, you know, 60 days. I mean, we're barely not even 30 days out of this whole proclamation as, again, we're recording here in the uh, middle of April. So there's more to come, and we'll certainly be talking about that on this program and probably a lot of our other ones as that moves forward. But again, some of the purposes, some of the ideas that come along with this are important. And there already was a lot of conversation around the preservation. I mean, anyone who has ever been out to that site would be hard pressed to not have either heard of or been told about the poppies i mean they were a feature they were part of what the president actually read in his notes and comments on this along with the announcement of the declaration of this as a national monument uh, that was one of the things that was brought up among other things correct yeah the mexican poppies are amazing most people they may not know the name of the land but when you mention the poppies, the poppies. they they know yeah. exactly where you're talking about they all have stories from over the years of picnics and visiting and quinceaneras and just fo photographic opportunities. And it is very well known within the community. Absolutely. And I mean, among other things, there's poppies fast. There are the people taking the pictures. Again, recommend you do so safely. And we're, unfortunately, as we're talking about this right now, if you're just becoming aware of that and have never seen it before, we're basically at the end of that season right now. It's because they are fleeting in their own way, even if they show up every year. That is correct. They We get big blooms of the Mexican poppies when the weather is just right mm. in winter. So we need the right um, temperature, the right rainfall, and then we get gorgeous blooms. The one that I saw was in 2020. Mm. It was the, um, It was amazing. And then I think the one prior to that was 5, 10, 15 years prior mm. to have okay. big blooms. And, but there's always some poppies out there. Always some, but again, them being just like the fields of gold that mm -hmm. have occasionally been seen out there as a, a lot of the stories that were around this and being published about it often featured that prominently. Those are, you know, your select years, but Poppy's Fest happen every year that it's possible to have events going on anyway. So that's, and that's kind of one case in point of the preservation of this site that can always be seen and is really not happening not even necessarily anywhere just within our community, but very few places around the world seeing that kind of thing. Yeah, we we have an amazing opportunity here in the Northeast with where the flowers bloom. Mm -hmm. uh, many people have tried it in other areas of the community, but it needs that right soil, that right location, right. and that's where they grow. Absolutely. And just as a general PSA, I always say whenever we talk about them, don't go pick the poppies. A, they do not make bouquets. Like, there's an argument for flower pressing, but even then, if you don't leave them there and let them finish the flowering, you're not going to have more poppies because that's the process. Yeah, you need the seeds, um, and yeah. they're in the flowers, so we got to let them go through their whole um, process of going um, dormant again. Exactly. So that's why this is important and why it's both a you know community good and hopefully won't be subject to tragedy of the commons. And again, given the fact that we are talking about the preservation going on with this and going forward, you know, in eternity, as long as we have these things on the books is just great news. So some of the other proclamations include, again, you mentioned a little bit earlier, the declaration of one of the trails anyway that you all are anticipating because of, and that's kind of a way I want to get back into, the history both of the site and of the preservation that's gone on with it here. So again, that, that proclamation and the naming of that trail for those of them who are just joining us, what was that first named trail that is going to be on the site? The Judy Ackerman Trail. So the Judy Ackerman Trail, who do believe has been a guest previously in previous years on this mm -hmm. program, was one of the cast of characters of thousands who has been part of the preservation of this and one of the arguably more important ones because of her consistency with it over decades. And that's truly the scope that we're talking about when it comes to this preservation effort. Because, I mean, sure, the natural environment, the mountains have existed since time immemorial. But the specific reason that this area has been saved is because of, again, a, a few confluences of history. Yeah, the, the, um, a big component of a national monument happening is having public support. Right. Showing public support. So we collected over 137,000 letters with many members and organizations and partners and 
Um, Judy was with us when we delivered them to the Department of Interior this past summer, a year, um, almost a year ago. Yeah. And um, you, we, we have never had opposition to Castle Range becoming a national monument. And we have only received congratulations sure. since that moment has happened. Um, I think there is an education piece for folks. Um, some people may believe that it's a takings of private property, but national oh. monuments don't work like that. So it's usually federal land transferred to another federal agency. In this case, we um, have the unique opportunity of working with the U.S. Army right. for their first national monument. And we're looking oh, really? forward to that. It's the uh, first national monument directly managed by the U.S. Army since the national battlefields were transferred to the National Park uh, Service in the 30s. Interesting. I didn't really realize that aspect of it because I definitely knew that that was a unique part of this, but I didn't realize that it was completely unique and that the Army was directly involved. Like, again, some of the other recent-ish examples that have happened, again, with the Oregon Mountains, there was different organization on how that was going to be managed so the army i mean besides definitely expertise being needed when it comes to like again dealing with some of the the uxo and stuff like that was pretty obvious i think to most uh, even casual observers aware of this but they didn't realize that this was their only one yes yeah so the oregon mountains desert peak national monument is uh, managed by the bureau of land management right and so um we are we just have the opportunity to work with the department of defense and we're looking forward to it and of course the great relationships that exist between the uh, many both bodies politic and organizations whether it be the city county of el paso mm -hmm. and of course with uh, fort bliss proper i mean uh, general eisenhower with an eye just to make clear for those out there in radio land uh that is again the current commanding general of fort bliss was a uh, prominent uh, fixture within both these declarations and then of course within the celebrations happening on this putting his input in already absolutely so we had a wonderful celebration and we had um the assistant secretary to the army rachel jacobson we had the undersecretary of the army general major eisenhower was there and he spoke more on the future um, direction that the national mm -hmm. monument will take which is that it will take time that right. it needs to be safe, that we need to make sure we think through this, and that they're looking forward to working with partners um, to as they move forward on the planning process and the management process and um, sharing with the community what that looks like. And right now, the important message is that it is conserved as a national monument right. in perpetuity, but it is closed to the public. Yes. And again, there are again, certain things that happen. I mean, there are avenues into seeing it and stepping into, in a way, parts of the site. Again, there are the couple of museums that exist within this general area that we're talking about. Again, I got that map up for you all on screen. It's kind of, again, uh, bounded by on the east and west, either 54 or the peaks of the Franklin Mountain itself. So, And then again, Hondo Pass to the south. And then just kind of in general, there's a specific street you mentioned, but just past the curve of 54 before it kind of branches out towards Oro Grande. It's kind of the general way you can think about it. There, so there are a few, like there's the overlooks right off of Trans Mountain Drive that you can see there. And then there are, of course, again, the museums. And then there are some of the designated areas for which Poppy Fest happens. And again, not happening right now, just to make that clear. But a lot more to come is, I mean, it's just an exciting time. It is. It is. We're looking forward to it. Um, having a national monument in the city of El Paso in the El Paso mm. County is an amazing opportunity for access for people to see a national monument. You know, lots of people don't have this opportunity. Sure. And, you know, for some folks, you just look out your window and like, hey, there's a national monument. Yeah, and that'll be a feature for a lot of people or just driving by casually in the community from most, you know, points north, south, and even east and west. So, tell you what, we're going to have to talk more about that and some of the history of how this came about here in just a minute. Again, joining us here in studio right now is Janae Renault Fields, Executive Director with the Frontera Land Alliance. You want to find anything more about them and some of the stuff they put out here about this, uh, FronteraLandAlliance.org, Frontera, F R O N T E R A L A N D Alliance dot org. So talk more about that and about the features of this after this next break on News Radio six ninety KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. 
Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the Old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexican. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. Usually at this point during the program, tell you what we got coming up for you next week on the program. And uh, next week, we'll actually be featuring, well, some of that music history and some of the performance history in town, but also of a specific venue, the El Paso County. County Coliseum. We're going to be talking with the El Paso Sports Commission, the uh, chartered organization that has the contract in charge of managing it and the related activities out there, both in its history and the history of the location and the many performances that have happened over the years and the many different types of events that have been held there. A lot of y'all been bringing up memories and some of our other even different programming, so that's what we'll be talking about next week on the program, the El Paso County Coliseum and its varied history of performances and events over the generations. And, uh, of course, if you want to uh, find out about that, so go over to our social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch. So, again, uh, joining us here in studio right now is uh, Janae Renault-Field, Executive Director of the Frontera Land Alliance. And so some of these specifics about what is being preserved out there with Kasner Range. We've talked about, I want to feel, primarily both the natural history, of course, the geologic features, as well as the 
shall we call it prior usage that has led to the site kind of being what it is. But part of the proclamations actually came along with this of the declaration of this as the national monument that it is, is listing a lot more than I think people are fully aware of it out there. So um, the full declaration and proclamation has a lot of different aspects to it and uh, people can find it out there um, on whitehouse.gov. And we'll also have that linked over on our Facebook page. I mentioned a lot about the different aspects of the history, uh, different important parts of it but also including going back uh, for thousands of years in some cases with the natural history. So I'm just going to read, to kind of encapsulate that, the actual whereas, the functional, quote-unquote, sections of this. So uh, after mentioning the Antiquity Act, the proclamation goes on to say, whereas I find that Kasna Range contains significant archaeological and paleontological resources, rare and fragile biological and ecological resources, and unique geologic features that are of scientific interest, and whereas I find that Kasna Range contains sites of cultural significance to tribal nations and indigenous peoples, and whereas I find that Kasna Range is an important part of the history of Native Americans and the United States military, and whereas I find it is in the public interest to preserve and protect the objects of scientific and historic interest located within Kasner Range, and then there are a few more whereases, and then therefore declared by the president again under the Antiquities Act in order to uh, reserve these federal lands and interest in lands encompassing the area of Kasner Range. So that's a very quick overview, as much as it is technical and uh, legal language, of there's a lot of stuff out there besides even what we've discussed, again, like the poppies, the peaks, the unexploded ordnance, which, yes, is a feature, or, uh, you know, even the trails and such. There's stuff scattered all around that, including a number of, like, specific archaeological or paleontological sites, right? Correct. There are over 40 known archaeological sites, wow. um, including living structures, hearths, remnants of pottery, and other tools that are found on this land from the indigenous folks then. um even more recently with uh, a Vietnam village that helped in the training periods mm. for when they they used the land for World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam. And so there are a lot of different historical sites that are found there. There are natural springs yeah. that are actually on Kastner Range. Um, there are old trails that go up to them. And now I'm sure animals over the oh, sure. hundreds of years have, you know, that's where they find their water. Their various animals are found there. The Texas horned lizard mm -hmm. is out there. The black tailed prairie dog. We have the endangered Sneed pincushion cactus is out there. Okay. Um, I think what's important to note is that it has been closed to the public. Right. So research hasn't happened. Studies haven't happened um, that we are aware of sure. to collect this data. So what the knowledge that we have is from years and years ago when people did explore and go on the land. So that's just part of the, again, microcosm of options that come into this. And again, in the use and uh, aspirational use that comes along with this, all these factors are very much needing to be considered because there's more than any one aspect of this that can or even should take precedence because, I mean, again, yeah, this just has not been places that you could really go in any reasonable type of way. I mean, again, besides going through Trans Mountain and occasionally, you know, going again to those museums there, that's the closest I've gotten to this whole uh, several I mean, multi-thousand acre site we're talking about. Correct. Yeah. And it, what's amazing about it is that it also provides a great connectivity. Yeah. So you have to the south, Preserve Nature Preserve for Napland. Yeah, um, to the west is the state park. Mm -hmm. And that leads up into the Oregon Mountains Desert Peak National Monument. So there is a wonderful corridor of connectivity mm -hmm. for potential recreation in the future with Kastner Range, but also just for wildlife right now. And as climate changes, insects move, plants move, animals oh, sure. move. And so allowing them this connectivity, it is helping us as the future comes our way and just lets them have a place to live and adjust. Absolutely. So again, uh, I guess with us in studio right now is Janae Renofields, again, Executive Director of the Frontera Land Alliance. Got to take that next break right now. Coming out of this break, we'll talk more about the history of the site and again, why we've gotten to where we are now, of course, along with the preservation. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history, 
Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com. 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral one ep.com. To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 
915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners sell faster and for more money. Call Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850 today and get your home sold faster and for more money. That's Patrick Tuttle at 915-588-1850. Call him today. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on Saturday mornings on our YouTube channel, El Paso History TV. Go to youtube.com slash El Paso History TV for archives of the El Paso History Radio Show. Also on that YouTube channel, you can see for free many other videos, documentaries, and lectures about El Paso area history at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV. Additionally, watch a dozen TV documentaries about El Paso history for free there on our YouTube channel. This includes Legends of El Paso's Mountains, Gunfights of the Old West, El Paso's Waco Tanks, Mexican Revolution Sites in El Paso, and eight more TV documentaries produced by El Paso filmmaker Jackson Polk since 2001. And at youtube.com slash El Paso History TV, you can watch for free 20 short videos we produced that were broadcast on ABC7 KVIA TV newscasts. This series is called El Paso History TV and features Spanish missions and churches on El Paso's Mission Trail, plus the Guadalupe Mission in Juarez, Mexico. That church was built in 1659 and is the oldest known adobe building on the El Paso Juarez Valley. It still welcomes Catholic worshipers today. Go to El Paso History TV on YouTube.com. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page Remember in El Paso When, run by Chief Administrator Barbara Gibbon-Baney, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso When on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom at Lee Trevino and Pelicano and see their website at missiondelrey.com, 915-440-2140 for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the ups and downs of the stock market, invest in real estate. M1 EP manages apartments in El Paso and helps investors buy, hold, and sell property. See the website, m1ep.com, m numeral -one, one epcom To learn more about the many benefits and long-term appreciation, call 915-592-4549. 915-592-4549. Many retired El Paso area homeowners don't know where to begin when it comes to downsizing and selling their home. Patrick Tuttle and his legacy home team follow a proven process to help retired homeowners. Thank you all so very much for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I am your host, Andrew J. Polk. Of course, we have a lot of partners that help us promote both this program, El Paso History, and other important things going on in the community, so particularly El Paso, Inc. You can go there for both our announcements of the shows, a little bit longer form if you find it printed in the B section each and every week, but specifically El Paso's business journal, El Paso Inc., is available for home or business delivery to receive El Paso Inc. and their in-depth reporting on the important things going on and affecting us here on the borderland. You can order it online or get your online subscription at ElPasoInc.com. Also want to take a moment to mention some of the things coming up from uh, some of our other partners and talking about aspects of El Paso history, including uh, coming up uh, towards the end of the month, April 29th, Saturday, the El Paso Corral of Westerners International No. 26 will hold a cowboy campfire gathering at Weaver's Cottonwood Ranch at uh, 17924 Castillo Road in La Mesa, New Mexico from 4 to 8 p.m. Experience frontier life through Old West storytelling exhibits, hands-on activities, and a chuck wagon meal. Event fee is $20 per person. Old West 
West devotees are encouraged to attend and dressing Old West also as well. RSVP by Monday, April 24. So for information and to do so, that number 915-241-6285. That's 915-241-6285. Again, that uh, April 29th, Saturday, but uh, RSVP by April 24th. So again, still joining us here in studio right now is uh, Janae Renault Field, again, with the uh, Frontera Land Alliance. So the history of Kasner Range is multifaceted in a whole lot of ways. We mentioned right now some of the both natural and prehistoric history and even going up into history when it came to uh, native use of the site. I think the proclamation also mentions about uh, like a, a site uh, dating to like the 13th uh, hundreds specifically, like a 1325, I think is one that's put towards. So there's a lot of history that has existed there. But when it comes to the immediate use of it, and basically the reason the again the site, at least for my mind, has been able to be preserved because it was previously used as a firing range. I mean, we it's part of the proclamation also mentioned the fact that uh, this site is entirely surrounded by the city of El Paso, and yet was an active firing range because it's one of those. Okay, sure. This is now surrounded by the city of El Paso, but at its point in time, I mean, it would have been, let's call it commiserate for that point in time to what, uh, you know, McGregor range is today. Like, sure, adjacent to, but far afield, and it certainly was when it was established. I mean, El Paso, the North, concepts are like northeast or west side weren't, didn't really exist. El Paso was the core of downtown, essentially, when we start talking about that modern use of it. Oh, correct. Um, my grandfather was actually sent here for World War II, oh, and wow. we're from Michigan for training. And it was a desert, mm -hmm. and there was dust flying. It was very different than what it is today. So it was a training from the, 20, um, the 20s to 1966, mm -hmm. and then it was closed. They used it for uh, training and um, a testing site for artillery. Right. And so the mountain's a great target. And so they use it for that. There's evidence of people have been on the land for over 10,000 years. Right. And we, to, as this effort moves forward, we worked closely with the Tigwes. Um, oh, they've been great. a huge partner in seeing this forward and sharing the value of the land to them. And, and then we worked with other partners. And that brought us forward from days long ago till now, over 52 years. And right. I've only been involved with the effort 12 years. And we, um, the, as it moved along in my 12 years, it changed. So right. when the effort started, the idea was preservation of Kastner Range. But the process wasn't known of how to do that. Really? And okay. so over the 52 years, uh, the, the community has investigated other ways this land could be conserved. It could be a conveyance to the Franklin Mountain State Park. But okay. it always came back to the issue that there are UXOs and MECs on the land. Right. And the liabilities always fall back to the Department of Defense. Mm. And so more recently, since about 2013, we were moving forward with the National Monument um, focus. Uh, okay. Because that's when the Oregon Mountains Desert Peak National Monument happened. Right. And we're like, hey, look at them. You know, that uh, criteria okay. for the Antiquities Act of 1906 fits Kastner Range. We have the historic component. We have the cultural component. We have the ecological and scientific component. And that's what we moved forward with for the National Monument effort. So that much as being a similar type of activity, again, with the you know Oregon Mountains uh, National Monument designation, kind of provided a blueprint for this then. It did. It did. It showed us. And then we learned along the way. We had many national partners that would mm -hmm. help us out and tell us how their national monuments happened. And then from there, we made it fit our community and what we are. And that's what we shared back to the decision makers in Washington, D.C. So there have been a couple of times, I mean, again, this effort going on for, again, more than half a century at this point of just the preservation part of it. it basically, I mean, it basically kicked up pretty short order after the stopping of the use of this as an active fire range itself, right? Yeah, that's when it became very apparent that action was needed because mm -hmm. over the years from the 70s, the 80s, and 90s, there have been endless proposals by um, private businesses, by the city of El Paso to develop the land for mm -hmm. different uses. So it has been on the radar of many people that uh, maybe we shouldn't have it open and available for natural open space and historic component, but 
Um, but we do now. Yeah, absolutely. Don't want to downplay the fact that this has happened. But in recent years, I feel like this has been, again, a constant effort ever since that point in time was the point I was trying to make. And it's kind of reached the surface for the casual observer, uh, so to speak, of, you know, silent running for a while for those not involved in it. And one of the most recent times was, you know, like, 2015 2016 when there was this uh, big push towards the end as we kind of mentioned end of the obama administration and that was the kind of the last time that there was a oh hey 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 can we see something happen here when it kind of reached the general public consciousness correct yeah we had at that time we were out in the public we were everywhere we were doing everything we could it was what everybody was thinking about it was the focus of the frontera land alliance i mean it was it was the focus and so given the fact that at that point in time again as the you know end of the obama administration the idea of you know doing one of those out the door kind of activities and trying to squeeze it in that way ultimately it of course didn't happen Mm -hmm. i mean did that feel like a setback to y'all was that disheartening or kind of what was the the mood at that time oh i'm sure it was but we kept going we knew that we were close And so throughout the President Trump's term, we just kept working on it. And um, we had uh, showed other community support. We just kept talking about it, educating people. And then things aligned, like Eric Pearson said in the previous hour, right. that you know the we had President Biden, and he made it part of his thirty by thirty America the Beautiful for preservation oh, sure. of open space. And so here we have cast the range, and then you know climate change was a big factor, and having spaces for that. And mm-hmm. here we have cast the range, and then of course his um, pledge for national monuments. Mm-hmm. And again, we have cast the range, and we fit all the boxes. And we had the right leaders come. We were able to come and meet with the leaders, the right ones in Washington, D.C. We had the right support from Congresswoman Escobar. And everything just fell into place. So the actual culmination of this then, I mean, it's not a you send off an application. They say, hey, you're approved. We'll have it at this point. It's a little both a bigger scope and scale than that. Anytime you get start involving federal government, things are not simple i'm just going to put it that way but the specific requirements they all had to actually like see this through and and do it there were some very technical things and some very i'm not going to call them like clandestine things but damn near almost right yeah it is uh, the lesson i've learned is patience and persistence (laughs) which can last you know decades but patience and persistence and but you have to believe in your cause you have to speak up for it and if you think it's a value then you stick with it so when it came to the actual y'all finding out that this was going to happen, I mean, this, I mean, it, the news, I think, came out, finally hit in the general public basically like the day before the actual announcement was made because y'all had some, if not explicit requirements, very much a, hey, this is how this works kind of things that you were told, right? Yeah. So what happened was Saturday, um, about 10 of us received an email And what the email said is that we were invited to the Environmental Summit in Washington, D.C. No mention of Kastner Range. So we flew out on Monday with the hopes that we would be mentioned. Uh, Monday evening, there was some talk. And then uh, we learned on Tuesday with everybody else that the National Monument was happening that we did fly up for a cause. (laughs) And and then we flew back out on Wednesday. Wow. So... I mean, again, all uh, the hurry up and wait has the flip side of it of then everything happening at once. Right. Then you really hurry. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, the really hurry and come along with it. So the culmination of this and, again, the signs that are now out there and can be seen and the many efforts going forward. I mean, this is a very exciting time. But, again, just to kind of put the pin in it, the work just begins for you all, really. Oh, correct. We There's planning and communication. There's so much investigation to happen on the UXOs and the MECs and what to remove. And we, we the public, um, are the Cast and Range Coalition, we don't want to see the whole acreage cleared um, in a bad way. In a clear cut kind yes, of way. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, you, we don't need to scrape all the property. Um, and so there's the first trail will be the Judy Ackerman trail. So we're right. looking forward to that planning process, the trail getting developed and on the ground and possibly using an existing trail would be great. 
Absolutely. So, again, got to take that next break right now, getting towards the last segment of this hour. Again, that's uh, Janae Renault-Field, the uh, Executive Director for the Frontera Land Alliance, talking further about kind of some of these plans and other activities going on. So stay tuned for more on the El Paso History Radio Show after this quick break on News Radio 690 KTSM. You are listening to the El Paso History Radio Show, streaming on Facebook, where you can find archived radio programs. The El Paso History Radio Show also streams on the Facebook page, Remember in El Paso When run by Chief Administrator Barbara Given Bainey, known as BGB. Check out that page for thousands of archived pictures and videos of El Paso history. Remember in El Paso when on Facebook. Visit Mission Del Rey Southwest for a huge selection of El Paso souvenirs, decor, and gifts. Mission Del Rey features El Paso saddle blanket products and thousands of Southwest, Native American, and Mexico items, plus unique pottery, blankets, and turquoise jewelry. Bring your family and out-of-town guests to visit Mission Del Rey Southwest's large showroom, at Lee Trevino and Pelicano, and see their website at missiondelray.com, 915-440-2140, for souvenirs, gifts, and decor. Mission Del Rey Southwest. Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina serves the old Griggs Mexican food recipes in a new location at 6761 Donovan Drive. Enjoy great New Mexican food with cold beer and the Juan and only margarita from the cantina. The managers and cooks from the original Griggs Restaurant serve tacos, combination plates, and sopapillas. Get the best Mexican food in the valley at Pepe's New Mexican Restaurant and Cantina, 6761 Donovan, near Loop 375. Call 877-2152. M1 EP Management Corporation is proud to sponsor the El Paso History Show. If you're tired of the Epson... Thank you all so very much for having joined us here for the El Paso History Radio Show, airing in this pre-recorded episode on News Radio 690 KTSM. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk, and again, joining us here in studio with us has been Janae Renault Field, Executive Director for the Frontera Land Alliance. And so we've been talking a lot about Kasner Range National Monument, the uh, very many things that are going on and will be coming up with it. Uh, but, of course, it would be remiss in not mentioning the fact that, I mean, Frontera Land Alliance, as much as this is one of the cause celebres that you all have going on right now, you all do a lot of other stuff, including a lot of other uh, preservation trail maintenance. I mean, we've mentioned a couple of them kind of in at least a little bit, a Lost Dog Trail, uh, Napland that's uh, nearby it. But there's a whole lot more that you all end up having a work on and a direct hand in, right? Yeah, so our main mission is for preservation of open spaces, mm -hmm. which can be working farms, working ranches, and open Chihuahuan desert. And so we do this with public and private owners. Sure. And so if it's a private owner, the land remains private, and they continue to use it and operate it as they have been. Um, with the public one properties that we've been working with, it's the Lost Dog Nature Preserve, Napland Nature mm -hmm. Preserve, where it is open to the public, where there are recreational trails for hiking and biking. We um, have other discussions happening right now on other properties for preservation. Oh, sure. And another big component of helping people understand the value of the desert and why we do what we do and why it's important to have financial support and support through volunteers as a nonprofit is an education outreach program where we mm. go into classrooms and we talk about scat and furs and mammals and flora where kids have never seen and been exposed to these things. Sure. And maybe they haven't looked at a flower up close or, you know, looked at a rock and really thought about the geology behind it and mm. the history of how it was formed. So we, we're out there with organizations in schools, um, on the lands, showing them leading hikes, helping people understand how to use the land safely, how to respect the land and look at your surroundings, see what's around you. Um, from the biology side to we have moon um, talks and hikes uh, oh, mm -hmm. and collaborations with many partners. And we have art and nature program where, you know, part of nature is mental and physical health as well. And so we're, we try to um, engage all interests just to see the value of what's out somebody's window. Absolutely. And uh, there's a couple other sites because, I mean, we mentioned a lot of big ones, but there's other ones such as like the Thunder Canyon Conservation Easement, the Joaquin Tetchner Nature Preserve at Wrestler Canyon. That's one that you can see uh, marked in a sign over not too far from like the Whole Foods development that is uh, there off of uh, Mesa near Wrestler. So those are just a few bits of overview of the work that you all do and how that, again, mission will be continuing on with Kasner itself and in, in general in the community. So if anyone wants to get involved with these kind of things, they want to be a part of it, they want to have the chance to either go out, help with this kind of work, I'm sure you all are always looking for volunteers. 
Absolutely. We have trail work. We have, um, we're actually with Project Move tomorrow with UTEP doing yeah. a trash cleanup at Wrestler Canyon. The oh, wind okay. blows it in from I-10. Yeah. And so, yeah, we're always looking for volunteers, sponsorships, donations, experts that can help guide hikes. And so they can learn more information at uh, FronteraLandAlliance.org. And um, they're welcome to call the office or even email me directly. Absolutely. So there's been a lot we've covered today, both on the history, the scope, the scale, and the work to come when it is with Kasner Range National Monument itself. It, kind of to put a pin in that, is in kind of a, in a nutshell, what do you hope happens with all of this? What is if you could kind of give an aspirational view, regardless of the many complicated steps that it will take to achieve it, at the end, and I mean, even if there can be an idea of an end, but at the culmination of these current efforts anyway, what do you want to have see and be and be available out there? I would love to see the opportunity for visitors, whether they're from our region or from the, a different state or around the world, but to come and learn and see the history and culture and the desert and understand, you know, folks lived there. They used the land and why it was so important to them and to use it safely and to um, have that opportunity to see the Chihuahuan Desert would be amazing. Absolutely. So that's some of what's being worked on. And, of course, there'll be a whole lot more to come with it. But uh, we're going to have to leave it there for today because we are out of time for this program. So, again, joining us here right now in studio has been Janae Renault Field, Executive Director with the, again, Frontera Land Alliance. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us about the many aspects of this and the work that you all do and what's to come here today. Thank you very much. Absolutely appreciate that. And appreciate you all for joining us here for the El Paso History Radio Show. I've been your host, Andrew J. Polk. We'll be back next week as we are every Saturday, 10 to noon, right here on News Radio 690 KTSN. Have a great weekend, y'all.